All right, as we continue on, we are actually in Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. As we continue our study through the Judges, and some of you are looking, you go, boy, Pastor, you skipped a few. You better believe it, man. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of Judges, and I'll just tell you what's been going on, okay? Uh, the children of Israel sinned. They cried out. God punished them. They cried out. God said, sent a deliverer to save them. This is the cycle that they're stuck in. They're, they're having all kinds of problems. And, and we now come up onto a time where they're exceedingly bad. They were, they were a little worse than, than most. In fact, we could probably argue that way all the way through. This time, this time. Chapter 10, verse 6, it says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Asherah and the, the gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the Amorons and, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Now, a lot of us misunderstand what it means to serve God. What it means to serve God, to worship God, is to give God everything. All my talents, my gifts, my abilities, my resources, everything is God's. And when I stop giving everything to God, and I start serving other things, I reject a good God who has blessed us with all that I have. That all that we have, that breath you're breathing, you better thank the Lord God for that. Better thank the Lord God. You see, they forsook God. They began to try to serve God and many other gods. But see, here's the thing. You cannot serve Yahweh. You can't serve Jesus. You can't serve two masters. You either serve the God, the God of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, wrong order, but that's okay. Or you serve yourself. And one of the problems, one of the problems in the life of the church, one of the problems in the life of, of the American Christian is, is spiritual talk, religious talk. You know what I'm talking about, right? You ever met somebody? Or maybe you haven't met. We live in a social media world. I appreciate it, by the way. We live in a social media world. Man, one minute they're, they're, they're putting all these memes about how good Jesus is, and then they're chewing out people in the next thing. They're just burning people down. Or they can be talking to you personally about how good God is. And this is where self-righteousness comes along and gets us in trouble in the hypocrisy the church is so famous for, right? As we talk a good game. But when we go out into the community and something's not going our way. We don't act like good Christian people. We act the other way. But we mix it and we change it. So we need to understand something today. That religious talk sounding spiritual is no substitute for an intimate personal relationship with God. It is no substitute for being faithful to God, serving Him and serving Him alone. You see, they, they, they sinned against God and it angered Him. Verse 7, and, and He punished them. That's what He does. That's what God does. And so, verse 9, it says they were greatly distressed. Verse 10, it says, So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our, forsaken our God and served the Baals. And they didn't just serve a couple of them. They just kept adding to it. it it's it's kind of like, it, it's, it's like this. When, when they started serving Baal, they started adding to it. It's kind of like you picked up Showtime and you started watching what you weren't supposed to. So you added Cinemax and you started HBO. You added the Playboy Channel. Just throw it on there. You laugh. But it's true. You ever notice how one sin leads to another and another and another and another? How we can justify greater evil in our lives? 
Be careful. And then when we get in trouble because of it, and this is the way Israel was way too often, they'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's be honest. When you get pulled over, and all of you have been pulled over by this point if you've got a driver's license, right? Yeah. No? You just ain't drove through the right town yet. <laughs> I'm going to call Eustace and tell him. <laughs> Maybe I'll call a friend in seven points, but anyway. Hey, no, but do you find that when you get pulled over, are you truly repented or are you sorry you got caught? I'm sorry I got caught. Okay, let's just be honest. Okay, I'm going to pay that ticket and I'm going to be respectful because if I'm respectful, I usually get out of it. Don't tell the cops. Okay, but most of us are sorry we got caught. Israel is sorry for their actions got them caught, but they're not interested in changing their lives. But they're going to play God. They're going to play a little game with God. It sounds like repentance, but it's really just lip service. Oh, I won't do it again, mama. And next thing you know, they've done it again. You see, a sudden, desperate, a sudden, desperate moment of, of religious talk, a, a, a sudden prayer of saying, I will, I will confess my sins. I've sinned against you, God. And a, and a token, and what do I mean by token? You know, a token of religious actions. You know what people do? They get in trouble. They go to church once in a while. Hey, honey, we're having problems at home. Let's go to the church. They go to church for about three weeks, and then they're done with that. Some of y'all seen that, haven't you? A moment of desperation. A moment of desperation is no substitute for a faithful, consistent walk with God. See, they're greatly distressed. They've said they've sinned. But God's about had enough. He's fed up. Verse 11, it says, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and the Amorites? He said, Man, I have delivered you how many times? You're not repentant. You just don't like the consequences of your actions. You don't like the consequences of what's going on. Verse 13, he says, Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods, therefore I will no longer deliver you. Go cry. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. Listen, you've rejected me so many times, I'm done. You say you want to come back, but you don't mean it. I'm going to tell you something. Until you're ready to give up the sin, is it really repentance? Listen, it says right here, it, it says... It says, it says now, verse 15, it says, now the sons of Israel, we have sinned. They know they've sinned. They're caught. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Well, what seems good to God is do what? To punish you. Man, it's hard when you say God wants to punish us, but he punishes our babies. Listen, if you don't ever spank your children, you threaten them, threaten them, threaten them, you don't spank them, are they ever going to change their behavior? That's better than an amen right there. I think that girl's Miss Faint. Mm. Tell you what, parents of the year right over there. I'm going to move over here so I don't get swatted. Man, I'll take it. They say, they say in the same breath, do whatever you want to do. Do what is good to you, Lord. Please, only please deliver us this day. Only get us out of this trouble. But you had not learned your lesson. Now they're going to, you know, God's already said he's not, he's not interested. So they put away, they put away their foreign gods from among them and they, they serve the Lord. Now let me give you a picture of this. Let me give you a picture of this. So, so they own all these little idols to serve all these little gods. And they put them away. What God wants is for you to destroy the idols. 
If you've got a problem with drinking, if you know good and well you can't handle drinking, you're an alcoholic and you know it. Hey, I got plenty of family down that road. You don't say, you know what, I ain't pouring out this good liquor. I'm just going to put it in the garage so it won't go bad. I'm just going to put it over here on a shelf. I'm going to put it away. And I won't drink for a while. And I'll get back and I'll go to church. I'm going to tell you something. God has called you to pour it out. God has called us when we have a sin in our life that separates us from him to destroy it, to obliterate it, to remove it. Not just kind of keep it stashed away. Stashed away until I can use it again till I feel weak and I need to dabble in it again isn't that the draw of sin you know you've gotten in trouble so you put it to the side you put it to the side but then you sneak back over to it slowly and secretly rejecting God. You see, a sudden, sudden act of desperation will never substitute a faithful walk. You can't, you can't turn, turn on and off your walk with God. You're either with him or you're not. You know, it's kind of like you can't turn off being married or not. You're either married or you're not married. You're either married or you're not married. It is that simple. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. You're not kind of pregnant. Some of you thought you were. But you either are or you aren't. And by the way, you're either a man or you're a man or you're a woman or you're a woman. I'm just going to throw that for you. That's free. Okay? You either are or you're not. You can't turn this off with God. God is not there to play games with. He doesn't want to hear our spiritual talk, our, our sudden sense of godliness because we're in a desperate situation. But I'm going to tell you something. Do you want to know how a tent of God's ear is when you've been walking faithfully with him? You know, the Bible says the prayer of a righteous man avails much. That includes women. Because when you're walking with God, oh, you know how to listen to him. You see, if you suddenly start serving God, you started coming to the church for the first time in six months, whatever it is, you finally start doing a little bit, you don't instantly become an expert on how to make choices, on wisdom, on God. Uh, an expert on how to make godly choices. In fact, we see that these people have so prostituted themselves out to other gods by serving them, we see that they begin to mix worldliness, false religions in with Yahwehism into their daily life. So what happens? Instead of sitting there, listen, now we do see that little part and it says about God. He could bear the misery of Israel no longer. God was ready to save them even though they didn't deserve it. That's called grace. That's called mercy. And if you're sitting in here and you think you don't need grace, you don't need mercy, and you're better than somebody else, hold up. That's called self-righteousness. So God's going to help them. I don't know if God has told them this. We don't know if this is part of, part of God sharing with the, the author of, of Judges so we know what's going on in the background. But what we see in verse 17 is the threat has come on. Ammon has come on and they've summoned up and they've encamped against Gilead. In verse 18 it says, Then the people and the leaders of Gilead said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the sons of Ammon? He shall become head over all of us. Who is the man? You see, they cried out in desperation. They put away their idols. They didn't destroy them. Instead of waiting and listening for God to deliver them, they instantly went back to a worldly way of thinking. Who is the man that's going to come? We need to go find him and make him leader over us when that is God's job to do, to call them out. You see, that's what comes. Don't, don't talk spiritual. Walk and live it out. Talk with God. Know God. Don't, 
you, you see in this passage that they, they are just still doing their own thing according to the way the other tribes would do it around them. They go on, they go in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1, they go and they find Jephthah. He's one of them. It says valiant warrior, but I want you to understand he is an outlaw. He is an outcast. He's not valiant. He is a vigorous and powerful warrior. But the reason he's such an outcast, and it's not because he's the son of a harlot, which his daddy went and did what he shouldn't have been doing because of sin in the community. Let me say, when things get bad, things get bad. They go and they find Jephthah. Who was an outcast because his brothers kicked him out. Kicked him out and said, this, this son of a harlot will not have any of our father's inheritance. And the elders agreed with him. And let him run him off. Verse 3, it says, so Jephthah fled from his brothers. And he lived in the land of Tob. And worthless and worthless followers gathered themselves about Jephthah. And, and they went out with him. Now I need you to understand something about Jephthah real quick before we go too far into this. Jephthah was not living in the community because he was run off. That's true. But we know and we learn a lot about his character and their lack thereof. When we see it says, and there was these worthless men these worthless followers who gathered around him. He was not Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. You know Robin Hood and his merry man? Still from the rich, give to the poor? No, 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 no. They were bad. They were a bunch of outlaws. They were outcasts. They were renegades. They were thieves. And they, they, they were marauders. They were not good guys. And see, they, and see, the thing is, is that in all of their tribe, there was no one worthy. They wanted to go find a fighter. They wanted to go find who they wanted. They wanted to find their man instead of God's man. You see, a little spiritual talk doesn't make up for years of neglect in your relationship with God. So it goes on. They negotiate about what his role and what his job will be. He, they offer him the title of chief, which is commander. That's verse 6. And he says, whoa, wait a minute. You rejected me. I don't want none of that. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll let you be head over everything, which is greater than being a commander. They're reaching out to one who has rejected him, rejected him, but he is negotiating a better deal because he is ambitious. And you'll notice once it looks like he's getting his way, the religious talk comes up. You see, I, I got to give credit to the elders because at least they weren't acting like they weren't. You'll note that they didn't say anything about God between verse 17 and to this point. Verse 8, it says, for this reason now we have Return to you that you may go with us and, and fight with the sons, fight with the, the sons of, of, of Ammon and, and, and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. You see, they didn't seek God to agree with this. They didn't seek God's face or who God's man. Remember last week we talked about Gideon and Gideon was the least of the sons of his father. And what happened? God went and found him, right? God went and found him. It's not about being this great valiant warrior. It's not for us to choose. It's for God. They're not trusting God. They're asking for his help, but they're not accepting his help. They're still doing it on their own. And religious talk, no amount of religious talk can make it look that way. But here it comes. Verse 9, so Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, he said, if you take me back to fight against the sons of Amnon and, and the Lord gives them up to me, Will I become your head? And they said, the Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. Jephthah went on with the, with the elders and the people, and they made him head and chief over them. Jephthah spoke all, spoke all these words before the Lord as, at, at Methuselah. You see, this is nothing more than some religious window dressing. 
And nowhere in this passage have they sought God's guidance, direction. They're spending more time speaking at God instead of seeking God. They're, they're, they're painting the situation with God's words because they're getting what they want. They're getting the better deal. When they should be seeking God. They should be waiting and listening to God and seeing what's going forth. Did I tell you Jethro was no prize? Man, he's a piece of work. And I'll just tell you that. And if you know the story, you know what's going to happen. Now, here's what goes, goes forth. Verse 12, it sends out messages to the enemy king. And, and, and he states a, a clear purpose. He says, the land was never yours in the first place because our God gave it to us. Simple argument. He's right. He's true. He's telling the history in this passage just according to the scriptures as it is, as it's stated. And he's 100% correct. But you see, our religious talk will ultimately, the more we talk, the more it will hang us. It will reveal our level of relationship with God. And in this case, whether, whether it's deep or whether it's shallow, and, whether, and in this case, it shows his ignorance of God's word. So we pick up in verse 23. We already said he makes this argument of why the land is his because God has given it to him. Since now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel, are you to possess it? Do you not possess? What was that? Chemosh or Chemosh or however you want to say it. Your God gives you. Do you not possess what your God has given you to possess? Whatever the Lord our God has driven out before us, we possess it. Now on the surface it sounds like he's giving God all the credit, right? Here's the problem. He just brought Yahweh from being the one true God, the only God, and brought him down to being just one of those other gods, to be petty and function just like him. God's word said there is only one God, and his name is Yahweh. There is only one. There are no other. I'm by myself. See, Jephthah has no problem acknowledging their God on par with his God. You see, he's ignorant of God's word. Like I said, our religious talk will reveal our level of relationship with God, whether deep or shallow. <laughs> Have you ever read, God blesses those who help themselves? Some, I heard some, I, some of you laugh because you know it's not in Scripture. Some of you had the uneasy laugh because you're going, is he trying to trick me? It's not in Scripture. The Bible says work, it does. Don't work, don't eat. It's the mentality, don't, 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 don't leech off of other people. But at the end of the day, God helps those who can't help themselves because we can't help ourselves. You can't fix yourself. I can't fix myself. Only by God's power are we redeemed, justified, changed in any way. That's why it drives me nuts when people say they found Jesus. No, he found you. God was never lost. We were. So we see this mixture of bad theology coming in. In our words, if they talk long enough, they hang themselves. And ultimately, we'll see where the, where the beliefs begin to mix. We've already seen a little bit with the way they picked their leader. Instead of letting God pick their leader, they did. They reached out to a man instead of trusting God to accomplish the mission. So in verse 29, it is the very first time that God is brought back up. In a way that means God's doing something. It says, now the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. So everything should be right, right as rain now, right? He should be mature in his walk with God. He's got the Holy Ghost. Receiving the power of the Holy Ghost 
is the great and most wonderful thing you've ever received. If you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you've been baptized. But if you haven't, if you don't from there faithfully walk with God, study God's word, live according to his ways, you're going to do stupid stuff. You're going to end up doing and making stupid statements. Verse 30, it says, Now Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand. Man, if all he had to do was pray and ask, and God would have told him, but he's making stuff up. He's doing stupid things. He says, If you'll indeed give them into my hand, then it shall be whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt op- offering. Famous last words of a fool right there. Listen. Listen. He crosses over, and God gives them the great victory. In fact, 33 says, it was a very great slaughter. They subdued them. They won. Remember, our religious talk will reveal our level of relationship with God, whether deep or shallow. It'll show our ignorance of God's word, and we'll begin to mix our belief with the world. We see that over and over again as we see, we see certain denominations within Christendom who have ordained homose- openly homosexual clergy and deacons who engage and, and assist with homosexual marriage. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you can show me that's biblical in here, I, I, I'll give you a $100 bill. And that's a lot for me. I'm poor. No, I'm kidding. But you get my point. They start mixing stuff, and it sounds good. He made a vow that whatever comes out of the door, I'll give to you, Lord. He didn't make any stipulations. Some of you know this story. You see, ultimately, it will show your lack of relationship with God. And when we say stupid things, there's always cost. When Jephthah, verse 34, when Jephthah come home to the house at Mesbah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and he says, Alas, my daughter. You have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Now you can tell he's a he is pretty immature because the first thing he does is he blames his daughter. Did you catch that? What's her fault? The returning soldiers coming back, everybody's going to go out and celebrate. I'm going to tell you, when, 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 when Maybank has a parade and it goes down my street, we're out there because we're getting our candy. Thank you. Best part of living in town, isn't it, baby girl? Thank you. Man, it, hey, it goes by twice. I got a big driveway. Y'all come on by if you ever want to sit there instead of coming downtown. All right? Yes, ma'am. Boy, she should have let her go to children's church. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> listen, this guy, he blames his daughter. You see, I don't like it when people, people talk all big and bad. But if he had a relationship with God, and he had a firm grasp and understanding of God's word, he would know that God would not hold him to an unrighteous, ungodly vow.
God will not ask you to do what is contrary to His character. He was hurt by it, but He was going to go through with it. You've read the passage. Some of you older folks, you know it well. Some of you younger folks, you hadn't had a chance. It says that the daughter says, well, Daddy, can I go and hang out with my girlfriends for a little while? <laughs> hey, at least somebody's listening, guys. <laughs> can I go and hang out with my girlfriends for a little while, if you don't mind? And he lets her go, and they come back, and... It says in verse 39, at the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did to her according to his vow, which he made, and she had no relations with a man. Now, is it possible that she ended up never marrying? This is what, this is what Sunday school wants to teach you as soon as you're little, okay? That she never married. He gave up his chance of having any offspring ever because of that was the sacrifice. It could be. But I'm more convinced than I've ever, and you're welcome to that, that opinion. I'm okay with it. Either one's good. But I'm more convinced than I've ever been after studying the passage and studying the character of Jephthah you see, the other people around, they had no problem with human sacrifice. Judaism always had a problem with human sacrifice. It's absolutely against God's word. And they were so about the world. And he was so about his ego, his position, and his word because he didn't know God personally, because he did not know God's word, and he was so full of just frivolous religious talk. I believe he murdered his daughter. <laughs> this people cried out to a God that they had rejected. They took it upon their own selves to pick their deliverer. They chose a man. It, by the way, it, it never really talks about him being called deliverer or judge. It says he led Israel. He was the head. It says these things. And they picked the absolute worst they could. And God delivered the people of Israel despite the leader, despite the people's rejection of him, with all their religious talk. You know, the Bible says we're supposed to talk in hymns, psalms to one another, that we're supposed to regularly praise the name of Jesus. And we should. That is necessary. It is important. It's all about what is in the heart. And that should come from an overabundance of spending time with God. And out of that, you can't help it. I can't, ex I can't help but to brag on my kids because my heart is full of my love for my children. Even when they're crazy in church. <laughs> I can't help it. My heart's full. You see, when our heart's full of Jesus, then we should talk. It's not just religious talk. It's talking of his greatness, his, his wonder, giving him the praise he rightly deserves. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking today about religious talk that is empty, that has no meaning. You see, too many Christians today 
We sit in our pews. And we give lip service to our God. And we walk out and we reject him. We reject him by a lifestyle that does not back up what we believe. Does not back up what scripture says. So today, I ask you, are you ready to repent of religious talk? of empty talk? Are you ready to truly not just put away those idols and an idol is anything that keeps you from worshiping the living God, faithfully serving the living God? Are you ready to destroy those idols? Well, the day is the day to do it. To confess your sins to him and will receive his forgiveness. If you are here this morning and you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you get drugged to church every Sunday because mama won't give up on you. And you sit there in rebellion, rejecting God constantly. And yet you know he's talking to you. You know he's speaking to you. Don't you think it's time to surrender to God today? To quit rejecting him. And to give your life totally and completely to him. Because I'll tell you right now. We will stand here on God's behalf and invite you and invite you to salvation no matter how long it takes. Don't sit there. Don't play with God. Run to Him and your life will be forever changed. Let us pray.